Um, this is terrific. So, um, okay, we've, we're, I think most people have logged on. Um, welcome to what's new in MPMI, the virtual seminar series for the MPMI journal. Um, I'm Jean Harris, I'm the editor in chief of MPMI and um, it's my pleasure to have you here today. We're hosting uh, a new talk, uh, a new uh, idea and, and field for us from the um, something we've been developing for uh, about a year and a half here. And for those of you who have been joining us, um, we're gonna be, this is another installment in the top 10 unanswered questions in the field of MPMI. What are the big questions that drive us? What are the big unknowns that we try to reach? And we came, we started this process, the MPMI journal, the editorial board started this process of brainstorming, um, trying to find what, what are the big unanswered questions? Because as scientists, that's, that's of course where we're going. That's what drives us. And we started this at the, um, the IC MPMI, the, the, um, back when we could all travel, um, we were in Glasgow, Scotland in the UK. Um, and we, this is where we pose this question to everybody. What are the big questions? And we came up with finally, uh, uh, after a lot of brainstorming, uh, crowdsourcing, 10 really important questions that we all agreed were ones that were, were really central to our field. And, um, the, we've had a few, for those of you who missed it, I gave a talk uh, in December. We have the recordings, you can still find that there, which gives you an overview of the top 10 and what were the big ideas, where we're going with it. Uh, in January, Ralph Pranstruga and Matthew Moscow um, gave a wonderful um, discussion, a wonderful talk on the review article that they wrote on non-host resistance. What is that? That's sort of the mystery of non-host resistance, why? Uh, are they sometimes non-hosts and why not? And, and that came out in January. And I'm very excited that we now have our uh, second installment in this series of reviews that we're hosting in the MPMI journal on each of these questions. And um, today we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Kenichi Tsuda uh, from Huajiang University in China, who's going to be talking about the perspective that he wrote. And, and I'll get to that in a, in a moment. Before I introduce him fully, I wanna let you know that this top 10 series is something that is informing a lot of what we do. So um, our, we have a focus issue coming out in May. So just a couple months on the top 10 question number one, how do plants simultaneously interact with pathogenic and beneficial microorganisms? So that's gonna be coming out soon. Really excited for that one. We are now also accepting articles for our next focus issue, which is on question number two. How does the abiotic environment influence plant microbe interactions? And I'm, I'm delighted to have Ken, uh, Kenichi Tsuda as one of our guest editors. Um, he will be editing this issue along with me and with Jacqueline Bede from um, McGill in um, Canada. And Ashley has just typed, I believe, the link into the chat if you want to learn, find the link to, to learn more about this focus issue and, and join. Um, also this summer, keep your eye out. We have a series of exciting e-symposia coming up um, that Mary Beth Mudgett, who is my co-host today, um, who is the president of ISMPMI, uh, that she has been organizing um, terrific series starting in July um, with, where we have some really top scientists from around the world. The first one is going to be on structure and signaling, um, thinking about our gene signaling, really some exciting work has come out in the past year. And um, that ties very much to today's topic, which is um, where Kenichi Tsuda is going to be talking about, um, really, if we look at defense signaling, we have different signals coming from the outside of the cell, coming from the inside, um, ETI, PTI, how do those intersect? Are they distinct? Are they really intertwined? And so that turned out at the, to be a real um, puzzle at the Congress. And since then, there have been a number of very thought provoking and interesting articles that have come out, including one just, I think, last week. 
And um, so anyway, very hot topic, really excited to have um, so many of you joining us today and really excited to have our speaker today, Kenichi Tsuda from um, Hwajong University. I'm gonna turn it over to you and I thought you could introduce yourself a little bit as along with the topic. Uh, so thank you. And just to remind you, as people go along, if you have questions, you may type them into the Q&A box at the bottom. Ken. So uh, do you see my slide now? We do. Good. All right, so good morning or good evening or good uh, midnight, everyone. Uh, I'm Ken Tsuda from Huachun Agriculture University in Wuhan, China. So uh, two years ago at ISMPMI conference in Glasgow, so researcher posted a number of unanswered important questions, so which were then summarized as top 10 questions. And the question number five was, does ETI potentiate and restore PTI, or is there really a binary distinction between ETI and PTI? So I was asked to write a review about this question, and Yuru and I wrote this review together. So actually, 11 years ago, so Fumi and I wrote this review that compares PTI and ETI. So since then, so especially during the last two, three years, so researchers have made significant discoveries for our understanding of PTI and ETI. So it's a good timing for uh, this thinking about this connection between PTI and ETI. Okay, so before I talk about this topic, I would like to introduce a little bit about us. So Yuru is the first author of this top 10 review. So he graduated uh, from China Agriculture University and got a PhD at the University of Minnesota with, together with uh, Jane Gracebrook and is currently working as a postdoc at the University of Michigan. So his current research interests uh, include organelle uh, cross-talk and cellular heterogeneity and signaling networks. So I got PhD in Japan and did postdoc uh, in the US and led a research group in Germany. And now I'm a professor in China. So as you can see, uh, I am uh, traveling the world. I'm a traveler, so hoping the world peace and understanding different cultures. So for research, so we study uh, plant immunity and immune-related uh, fight hormone signaling, and also plant microbiota using brassicaceae plants, including Arabidopsis and also maize. So we investigate how plants respond to microbes and also how microbes respond to plant or plant immune responses in order to understand how plants interact with microbes at the systems and also molecular level. So the idea is that when we understand the both plant and microbial responses during the interactions, so we truly understand such interactions. Okay. So we are also looking for uh, students and postdocs and also professors. So if you are interested, please contact me. All right, so in nature, and also agriculture fields, plants are attacked by a variety of pathogens, such as bacteria and viruses, omycetes, fungi, and nematodes and aphids. However, very curiously, most plants are resistant against most pathogens. So then the important question is why some plants are resistant? The answer and reason is that plants have the immune system. So this very, very famous review article written by Jonathan Jones and Jeff Dangle in 2006, so provided us with a very clear framework for plant immunity. So now I read uh, how they wrote uh, in, in this review article. So it is now clear that there are in essence 
two branches of the plant immune system. So one uses transmembrane pattern recognition receptors, PRRs, that respond to slowly evolving microbial or pathogen associated molecular patterns, mumps or pumps, such as flagellin. The second acts largely inside the cell using polymorphic NBLRR protein product encoded by most arginines. They are named after their characteristic nucleotide binding and B and leucine repeat LRR domains. So pathogen effectors from diverse kingdoms are recognized by NBLRR proteins. So this is how Jeff and Jonathan uh, defined uh, the two branch uh, immune system. So one is the one branch is recognition of mumps or pumps by PRRs. And the, uh, so this, uh, the other branch is a recognition of effectors by NBLR. Now it is also called NLRs. So this two branch immune system contributes to resistance against pathogens. So the review also proposed the very popular zigzag model. So in phase one, plants detect mumps or pumps via PRRs to trigger pump triggered immunity, PTI. So now PTI is also called as pattern triggered immunity. Okay. So in phase two, successful pathogen deliver effectors that interfere with the PTI, resulting in effector trigger susceptibility. So in phase three, so one effector is recognized by NBLR protein and activating effector triggered immunity and amplified version of PTI that often passes a threshold for induction of hypersensitive cell death. In phase four, the pathogen isolates are selected that have lost the red effectors and perhaps gain some new effectors through horizontal gene flow. So these can help pathogen to suppress ETI and selection favors the new plant NBLR alleles that can recognize one of the newly acquired effectors resulting again in ETI. So zigzag can continue. Okay. So this two branched immune system and also zigzag model provided very useful conceptual frameworks. When we, whenever we think about the plant immune system and co-evolution, co-evolutionary arms race between plant and pathogens. So indeed, so this debut was cited more than 10,000 times. Okay. However, so these uh, definitions uh, sometimes cannot be applied to some cases. For example, so mumps and or pumps are slowly evolving or conserved microbial molecules. Okay. So effectors are microbial molecules delivered into plant cell to enhance microbial fitness. So they effectors are virulence factors. Yeah. And PTI is triggered by MUMP and is mediated by PRR. So ETI is triggered by effectors and is mediated by NRR. So this is a definition made by Jeff and Jonathan. So, so one example uh, for difficulty to define the model immunity as PTI or ETI is here. So the Phytophthora sojai effector XAG1, so which is a virulence effector, is recognized by the PR RXEG1. Okay. So this model immunity is triggered by effector. So by definition based on the trigger, so this is an ETI. However, the receptor is a PRR. So by definition based on the receptor, so this is the PTI. So PTI, ETI, so it is kind of blah. So another example is TAR effector triggered immunity. So TAR effectors are effectors from bacterial pathogen, Xanthomonas, so which function as transcriptional activator 
of host genes, thereby increasing pathogen fitness. So some plants evolve activation trap here. So when the tie factors bind here, so immune executor gene is expressed to activate immunity. So these immune executor genes is not, are not necessarily in their art. So in this case, in some cases, so this effector recognition is not mediated by NLR. Okay. So now, so originally, so PTA and ETA by name were defined by what triggers immunity, so mom or effector or, or pattern or effector. So this uh, distinctions about triggers, what triggers immunity is still important, I think. However, so when we think about the mechanism, how immune responses are activated, what kind of immune responses are activated, so it will be better to define modes of immunity by what types of effect, uh, receptors mediate immune responses, because receptors define the type of immune responses, but not the trigger. So also a recent excellent review by Pintao Din and Xu Fan Xin's groups discuss this PTI and ETI as uh, focus on this PRR mediated PTI and NLR mediated ETI. So probably uh, like this, uh, we, we should define when we talk about the mechanistic things. All right, so I was uh, curious about the visions that Jonathan and Jeff had 15 years ago. So I, I searched uh, this uh, paper, uh, review paper and picked up sentences uh, describing the PTI-ETI relationships. Okay. So uh, they said uh, ETI is an accelerate and amplified PTI response and ETI an amplified version of PTI and NBLR dependent signaling and MAM pump mediated signaling require partially distinct components. The ex extent to which ETI and PTI involve distinct mechanism is still an open question. So ETI is a faster and stronger version of PTI. Do the transcriptional controls of PTI and ETI, which culminate in similar output overlap. So understanding the spatial interplay of PTI, ETI, and plant hormone and abiotic stress signaling systems is in its infancy. So I was amazed by that these statements are still true. And also questions raised 15 years ago remained mostly still unanswered. So however, so especially during the last several years, so researchers have made significant progress on NLR mediated ETA mechanism. So these discoveries so gave, really gave us a very a, the insight into the relationship between PRR mediated PTI and NLR mediated ETI. Okay. So months, so such as the bacterial flagellin or bacterial peptide glycans and fungal chitin are recognized as PRRs on the plasma membrane to trigger PTI. So also the plant's derived molecules are recognized by PRRs to trigger PTI. For example, uh, the plant's derived molecules include the damage associated molecular patterns, DAMPs, or a fight side kind. So DAMPs can be possibly released upon cell damage and the fight side kinds, uh, which may be actively released. So immune responses triggered by microbe delight and these plant delight molecules are very similar. So how then do PRRs recognize mumps and how do PRRs get activated? So I will introduce just one example. So FRAG22 is a mump from bacteria flagellin and FAS2 is the PRR for FRAG22 and BAC1 is the core receptor. So these are usually repeat domains of FAS2 and BAC1 
outside of the cell. So these are kinase domains, the FLS2 and BAC1 inside of the cell. So FRAG22, so these orange ones, induces formation of hetero complex within seconds through direct interaction with LR domain, now both FLS2 and PAC1. And FRAG, as you can see, the FRAG22 appears to act as a molecular glue of this FLS2 and PAC1 complex. So then, so this FLS2 and PAC1 phosphorylate each other and activate each other. And then receptor like cytoplasmic kinases, uh, RLCKs, uh, such as big one, uh, are phosphorylated, phosphorylated by this uh, receptor complex. And then in turn, this phosphorylated and activated RLCKs uh, phosphorylate downstream component to mediate the var various immune responses, such as uh, loss productions and calcium influx during PTI. So now a uh, little bit uh, talk about uh, how NLR functions. So pathogens, various pathogens, bacteria, uh, insect, and also the fungi, fungi or my seeds. So they introduce uh, effectors uh, into plant cell and these effectors interfere with the host component in very various uh, ways to increase pathogen fitness. So these effectors are sometimes recognized by intracellular receptor NLRs. So some NLRs directly bind the corresponding effectors and some NLR guard the host immune component, which are usually important for immunity and monitor changes by effectors on, on this uh, guarded protein, so-called GARD. And some NLRs monitor host decoys that mimic the real effector target to trap effectors. And some NLRs even have this decoy domain within the NLR protein. So in plants, so NLRs are broadly divided into three types. So one is a TIR type NLR, sometimes called TNL, and CC type NLR, and called a CNL, and CCR type uh, NLR called RNL. So in many cases, so these NLRs do not work alone, but work as sort of networks. For example, so TNL, yeah, so TIR type NLR required uh, RNA, so CCR type helper uh, NLR. So this is CC type, uh, CCR type NLR as uh, often called helper NLR because they help uh, other NLR functions. So this NRG1 and ADR1 uh, CCR type helper NLR. So this TNR, TIR type NLR uh, requires this uh, CCR type NLR and also the central immune component uh, EDS1. So CNR uh, require also RNA, CCR type uh, helper NLR to different degree. So sometimes without a uh, helper, it can function. Sometimes depend on uh, these helper NLR. However, so how these uh, NLR uh, molecularly functions uh, have been the really mystery for a long, long time. So only two years ago, so we got uh, some clue so actually this during the last two, three years. So we are really experiencing historical moment. So for how NLR functions in plant. So Gigi Chai and Jamin Zhou groups uh, reviewed 
crystal structures that uh, revealed by crystal structures that the, the one uh, CC type in NR forms pentamer upon activation. And this the pentamer uh, appears to be inserted into the membrane to form pore. Okay. And this pore may serve as ion channel, such as calcium channels, or maybe something else. So in any case, we still do not know how exactly the activated Zawan functions. So another uh, groundbreaking uh, finding was on TRI type NLR, TNL, how these NLRs are activated. So the Peter Dodds and Boston Kobe and Jeff Tango and Mark Nishimura groups showed that TIR domains, you now TNL, contain NADase activity. And this NADase activity is required for these NLR functions. Okay. So NAD is creeped to produce molecules such as ADPR, but in what sense this NAD activity, NADase activity, contributes to NLR functions, so remains not understood. So last year, uh, Brian Staskowitz and Gigi Chai and Jen Parker and Paul Schultz referred groups resolved the structure of TRI type NLRs, log Q1 and RPP1. So both uh, log Q1 and RPP1 form tetramer upon activation, so which leads to a formation of NAD uh, active, NADase active center. So with the consistency with the previous uh, publications. So although, so how TNLs activate downstream component is not understood, but all TIR type NLRs require CCR type NLRs and EDS1. So this is an important clue for how TIR type NLRs functions. So I will, uh, I will shortly come to this point. So very recently, actually February 25th uh, uh, this year, uh, Jeff Dangula posted a bioarchive paper. So how CCR type NLR functions. So odd active allele you know, the alapdosis RNA NLG 1.1 uh, triggers cells in Gothiana benthamiana without NLG1, uh, the native NLG1, ADR1, and EDS1, and also in human HERA cells. Structures of you know, NLG1 CCR domain is similar to that of the one CC domain. So Energy, so this odd active uh, energy one mediate the calcium influx in Nicotiana benthamiana without native energy one, ADR1, and EDS1. So this is a helper NRR and the central immune component and in human HERA cells. So these uh, calcium influx were blocked by calcium influx channel blockers. And odd active energy one form puncture on the plasma membrane, so which suggests, which may suggest they form some sort of a structures on plasma membrane, perhaps uh, some ion channel and maybe calcium, really calcium channel. And this, uh, the membrane puncture is consistent with the finding in also the very recent uh, bioarchive uh, papers. Um, here. So this is uh, yeah, actually one week ago. So all together, so this is a speculation. Okay. So how NLRs function together. So CC type NLR functions alone or through CCR type NLR, RNA. Okay. So these CC or CCR type NLRs form maybe calcium channel to mediate calcium influx, thereby 
inducing cell death and immunity. And TRI type MNR, uh, together with EDS1, activate CCR type MNR, RNA, and this activation leads to calcium influx and to trigger uh, cell death and activate immunity. So actually it's a dependency of NLR mediated cell death on calcium influx has been known for a long time. For example, these papers and many researchers have been looking for calcium channels that mediate NLR signal without success. So these new researches uh, may suggest that NLR themselves really form calcium channels so which explains why people did not find calcium channels responsible for calcium influx during ETI. As this is a, a I, I, I should be careful. So this is a speculation, a still speculation, and with some evidence. Uh, but clearly, so the much more research uh, is required. So. So how do PRR mediated PTI and NLR mediated ETI molecularly connect? So upon PRR activation, so RLCK activate RBOH, leading to uh, loss reactive oxygen species productions, and activate calcium channel, leading to calcium influx, and also activate MAP kinase cascade leading to activation of barrier substrates via oral via phosphorylation. And also in the nucleus, the rapid the transcription of reprogramming occurs. So essentially, essentially, so all of these immune responses occur in NLR mediated. ETI, so indicating the so immune responses during uh, PRR mediated ETI, PTI and NLR mediated ETI extensively overlap. So, however, so in contrast to PTI, the PRR mediated PTI, so how NLRs activate these immune responses uh, still remain unknown. So, in the case of calcium influx, uh, maybe directly mediated by CC or CCR type NLR themselves. So very recently in Nature's Pintao Din and Jonathan Jones and Xu Fan Xin groups made important uh, discoveries about the relationship between PR mediated uh, PTI and NLR mediated ETI. So uh, in short, so they showed the PRRs are required for both CC and TR type NLR mediated immune responses and PRR and NLR signal mutually potentiate. So like this PR mutant uh, showed compromised phenotype for ETI mediated or NLR mediated resistance. And also here, so the, the PR mutants should compromise uh, the NLR mediated uh, immune responses, the both uh, CC type uh, NLR and the TRR type NLR. So although so NLR requires PRRs, how NLRs use PRRs as, or PR signal remains unknown. So the re then the reciprocal question is, do PRs require NLRs? So in 2007, so Gabriel et al. showed that the PRR requires CC type helper NLR, NLR, NRCU1. And more recently, actually last year, Sarah et al. showed that the helper NLRs are not very important for PRR mediated PTI here. Yeah. Uh, but this, uh, however, these recent bioarchive papers show that CCR type helper NLRs are required for PRR mediated uh, PTI. So overall, as a summarizing, 
uh, these papers uh, may suggest that CCR type helper NLRs or some helper NLRs contribute to PR mediated uh, PTI to a certain degree. So all together, so this is a very, very uh, simplified model. So how PR mediated PTI and NLR mediated ETI function in real pathogen infection. So um, here, so PR mediated PTI uh, is the primary immune system. And PR mediated PTI and NLR mediated ETI potentiate each other for cellness and also immunity. However, how NLR feed into PR mediated immunity at molecular level remains still unknown. So when we think about uh, connections between PR mediated PTI and NLR mediated ETI, an important consideration is whether NLR signal feeds into PRR signal cell autonomously or non-cell autonomously. So in cell autonomous model here, so NLR activate PRR signal within the same cell. So for instance, so activated NLR mediate calcium influx, loss productions and MAP kinase activations and transcriptional reprogramming in the same cell together with PRR signal. So some NLRs form calcium channels, seems uh, to form calcium channels that mediate calcium influx, but this the calcium influx does not fully expand NLR mediated ETI. So one possibility is that receptor-like uh, cytoplasmic kinases, which is sort of a decoder you know, a PR uh, receptor activations. So maybe this, uh, the RACK uh, also get activated during NR mediated ETI and then regulate many different things as in PTI. Okay. So another possibility uh, is NRs somehow activate directly this PR without the MAP. Okay. So such so the ligand independent activation of PRs is known in animal systems, but not plants. So alternatively, but not exclusively, so NLR mediated uh, activation of immune responses might largely occur uh, cell, cell, uh, non-cell autonomously. Okay. So in this scenario, so NLRs mediate maybe calcium influx, so leading to cell death. Okay. And this cell death triggers the, the release nerve dumps. Okay. So these dumps are recognized by neighbor cells to activate PR-mediated PTI. Okay. Importantly, so NLR-mediated ETI often involves cell death so cell non-autonomous activation of PRR signaling by NLR mediated ETI would likely occur. So I come back to the question. Uh, so does uh, ETI potenti and, and restore PTI? The simple question is yes. Um, is there really a binary distinction between PTI and ETI and PTI? The simple answer is no. So PTI and ETI are integral for resistance against pathogens. So they are mechanistically linked. However, as I uh, discussed, how uh, PTI and ETI are molecularly connected uh, remain still unknown. So now uh, it's clear, so our understanding is not complete. In particular, so we need to understand the much more the molecular mechanism by which PRs and NRs activate downstream com immune component, so especially NRs. And another thing, so we need to investigate immune responses uh, in real pathogen infection case at single cell level to understand to, to, to what degree uh, the immune response during 
PR-mediated PTI and NLR-mediated ETIs are cell autonomous or non-cell autonomous. So finally, I would like to thank Jean for giving me this opportunity and Ashley for technical support. So I would also like to thank colleagues and viewers for their help to improve our review. And importantly, and all of you who listened to my talk, so my lab is recruiting uh, students, a master and PhD students and postdocs, and also assistant associates, even full professors. So if you are interested, please uh, contact me. So I would also like to uh, uh, advertise again and MPM my focus issue about plant microbe interactions and abiotic stress. So if you are interested in submitting paper, so please read Jacqueline and Jean and me. So I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Really excellent, interesting, insightful talk. Uh, really enjoyed that. Um, so, uh, well, I, that stimulated a lot of thoughts and questions for me. And um, I'm sure for many of you as well. I see we, we already have uh, a number of questions. Oh, and I just wanted to point out, I believe Ashley um, pasted into the chat that we have recorded this and it will be freely available. So please share with colleagues uh, and students. And um, if you just go back to the same place where you registered for this seminar, you'll be able to find the links as well as links to our previous talks. Uh, and that's also posted in the chat. So um, thanks so much. And I'm gonna start off with the first question and then um, I will have Mary Beth take the next one. So, so uh, should, I, should I stop? Uh, oh yeah, good idea. Why don't you stop sharing? Yes, lots of great opportunities to, to work in uh, the Tsuda lab. So I'm, I'm hoping you'll find some good interest here among our audience. And Jean, it looks like uh, Mike Kolonidis has a, a question, but could you put your uh, question, Mike, in the Q&A and we'll, we'll read it out for you. Good point. Thank you. Yes, please type your questions into the Q&A. Okay, so first question from Pritha Kundu. Do NLR reside inside the cell or can they be both intracellular as well as on the cell surface? Right, so um, the... The PRs have uh, usually transmembrane domain, so they localize on plasma membrane. So NLRs uh, localize uh, within the cell, so they don't have transmembrane. So, but some, some NLRs associate with the plasma membrane from inside of the cell. So they are not really cell surface, but sometimes some NLRs associate with a, a membrane from inside of the cell. So Kenichi, that was a great talk. I loved it. And uh, there was a question really thinking about calcium signaling. And so if a plant is naturally resistant, but grown in soil low in calcium, what's going on? Will this lack of calcium negatively affect the immune response to pathogens by the plant? What do you think will be happening? Right. Um, so that's uh, interesting and perhaps difficult questions to answer. Um, so the, the calcium is such a fundamental molecule uh, that require for many uh, plant physiological processes. And so usually uh, the, the more uh, the, the high concentration outside and then inside is low. And that's why this calcium influx Act, can activate uh, sort of a responses, not only immunity, and but also many different uh, physiological processes. But how this uh, calcium uh, sort of a concentration affect uh, immune responses, or maybe may be directly affect uh, some pathogen response? Um, I don't know. Probably we don't know much about this uh, this uh, kind of things. Good question. Um, okay, moving on. We have a question from uh, Sridhar Rang Ranganathan, who asks, he points out the, the differences between the Gardees in the Gard model and the decoy model seems to be very narrow. 
any clear cut distinguishing features between these two would help us to understand for identifying them and wondering whether their role in favoring pathogen fitness might be one factor and would like you to comment on this question. Right, so the mechanistically this a GAD or decoy model is the same, right? So just the, when GAD, so when this uh, like effect target is uh, uh, important, uh, uh, sort of a molecules for plant immunity, then people call that molecule or that protein GAD, because plant GAD. And when uh, it appears that such protein is not important and somehow the mimicking the similar to uh, important immune components that uh, like a other effective target. So then, uh, okay, maybe this is not important, maybe plant evolve as decoy. But the, the two really demonstrate that this is a guardian or decoy. Sometimes uh, indeed, uh, it's a, sometimes probably difficult. So, but the mechanistically, the guardian and deco is a, a pretty, pretty much the same. So our next question is really the thinking about uh, the plant immune system, the human immune system, and vaccination is quite hot right now. So this question is, is it possible to vaccinate plants to prime their immune systems against specific pathogens like humans? And I think they were trying to make a relationship with the PRRs in the tier. So that's a, that's a great question. So unfortunately, uh, plants don't have this adaptive uh, immune system. So plants cannot make antibodies uh, to specific antigens. So, but the plants have uh, sort of a immune system which can uh, activate or like a prime the sort of an immune response to the father attack. So this, is not as specific to human antibody or animal antibodies, but the plants can prepare for the sort of a next attack. Okay, so, and this is sometimes it's called uh, systemic acquired resistance or uh, induced uh, systemic resistance or you know, sorts of, you know, this uh, pathogen infection can like, uh, prepare plants for the next attack sometimes in like a whole plant body and also sometimes alarm the like a neighbor plant. So like a community protection with a different system from a human uh, immune system. Yeah, interesting parallels there and differences. Okay, so we have a question about the relationship with PRR and TIR. Right. So the, the direct connection uh, is not known. So the, the PR activation leads to activation, you know, for example, gene expression, you know, TRR, NLRs. So that's uh, like a, when PTI, uh, PR mediated PTI is activated, then the expression levels you know, of these NLRs uh, become higher. So this is one connection, but how TIR connects to PRR, so this is not understood. Looks like we have a couple questions from Stephen Mark, which is asking where are these activated resistosomes residing? He has one question on the CNR resistosomes and also one on the TNR resistosomes. Can you comment on that a little further? Right, so uh, this is uh, uh, still uh, open questions. I think uh, the, uh, we only know uh, the structure of uh, three, four NLRs. So Zawan seems to be uh, associated with a membrane. So maybe a CNR registrosome uh, is commonly associated with a membrane when they are activated and they form pores. Uh, but uh, we need to wait more, uh, many more structures and many more following up studies. So TIR, uh, it doesn't seem to be associated with a membrane. So also uh, we know some T TIR type and there are localized sometimes nucleus or different compartment. So we, we, we still don't know. So the, where they're you know, different registers are localized. So I think we, we to, to generalize, I think we need to wait more, many more structure studies. Great. 
So we have Mitchell Roth asks uh, a question. Um, NLRs require PRR for activation of defenses, but NLRs also require recognition of a certain effector. So is the NLR dependence on PRR actually an effector specific dependence? Are there examples of NLRs that don't require a PRR? And if not, do you expect that we will find examples eventually? Right, so the, the only, uh, the papers that uh, really showed uh, were uh, those uh, two recent nature papers from uh, Jonas and Kim Tao and then Xu Fan Xin's groups. So uh, they showed uh, clearly uh, those NLR mediated uh, immune responses require PR. So, um, but, so the some uh, some response uh, is probably uh, do not need PR so that during NRR mediated ETI. So uh, with that PR, well, that's uh, uh, hard to hard to think. But uh, yeah, uh, to to a certain degree, I think uh, the immune responses during NRR mediated ETIs do not need PR, but for full resistance, I imagine probably always uh, PR-mediated PTI components are required. But, you know, that the, the you know, the, the future studies uh, will tell us. Yes. Yeah, that keep us busy. <laughs> Mike Columis has a question uh, going back to calcium and calcium signaling. What's known about the role of the vacuole lo localized calcium in the crosstalk between PRRs and NLR pathways? Right, uh, we don't know. <laughs> Short answer, we don't know. Uh, but uh, these uh, calcium uh, localized in vacuoles are probably also uh, involved in uh, immune responses. But in, in the context, you know, this is PR and NR connections. Uh, we don't know how the vacuo located calcium affect. Uh, but uh, this also uh, interesting question because uh, this uh, calcium influx is not necessarily from outside of the cell. So it can be from vacuo to, uh, to the cell. So I think uh, any, any kind of compartment that store calcium uh, can be sourced now this calcium influx during uh, probably well, PR uh, may be more um, membrane, plasma membrane, but uh, maybe in some NLR may acti activate influx from uh, bacterial. Of course, with the, the importance of the um, nuclear envelope reservoir of calcium and symbiosis always makes me wonder um, whether you have that being activated here as well. Um, as a source of calcium. Okay, we have another question. Are the assays that are traditionally employed to probe PTI and ETI, ROS burrs, the hypersensitive response, uh, et cetera, sufficient? Or should we be introducing new phenotyping assays as we learn more about the mechanisms involved in plant immunity? Right, I think, uh, uh, you know, it's clear that more is better. So, you know, loss and pathogen uh, growth and calcium influx and all sorts of you know, gene expression and phenotyping. And, you know, the um, you know, recently probably like a, compared to uh, papers you know, a long time ago, the people measure multiple outputs. And this uh, makes us uh, like a, difficult to publish papers uh, because we need to measure lots of different things. But I think uh, this, the measuring different things uh, sometimes lead to interesting findings. Okay, so like a, some, like a calcium response is normal, but gene expression is compromised or gene expression is normal, normal but you know, some immune response is compromised. So this, uh, uh, the, by measuring these different uh, immune outputs, that we can understand more how this immune signaling uh, operates. So 
So Amit Kumar Rai is asking, thinking about probably some crosstalk and how PTI and ETI components are involved in other types of pathways. And uh, we have some, you know, older data that ties them into development. What are your thoughts about how they could be playing in other pathways? Right. So I mean, the the probably the most obvious one is a like a back one. So which is a co-receptor of FLS2. So the fragile perception, BAC1 is required. And, but also BAC1 is co-receptor of rational steroid uh, signal. So which is an important uh, plant hormone for pr uh, plant growth. So this uh, uh, such an important co-receptor is shared for PR signaling and uh, the plant growth, and like uh, the rational steroid signal. So it's clearly, uh, not only the PTI and ETI is uh, connected, but also this immune system is an integral you know, plant growth sort of a network. So I think the, ideally uh, we, we, we need to uh, think about everything, uh, like uh, how plants grow, how plants defend at the same time, and also at the same time, like a different stress, abiotic stress counts. So uh, yeah, so the, I think uh, we uh, sometimes we need to focus on certain things, uh, but also we should think about how plants uh, integrate different signals and different like uh, uh, internal cue for plant growth and external cues. And this is a you know, really huge task. I think uh, uh, we can uh, study this uh, for a long time. Yeah, I sometimes think of it as like a, a thermostat or a dial, you know, and, and some things are turning it up and some things are turning it down and, and the plant integrates all of those inputs and then wherever it falls, it, it pushes down development a bit, pushes up, you know, all the different aspects. Yeah. Well, that's, that's extremely important, uh, especially when we think about um, improvement of you know, agriculture is by introducing some new crop variety or like a, by using CRISPR cas like a, a changing something affect other things. So we need to really right. integrate like a immune system, abiotic stress, and also plant growth you know, at the same time. Yeah. Right. You can't divorce development from all of those things. All interconnected. Okay, Yiming Wang asks. Based on your transcriptome analysis, uh, there's a group of genes that were induced under PTI but not ETI conditions. If PTI is part of ETI, why does the plant still need those PTI specific ones? Um, so in general, so this uh, PTI, uh, like a transcription reprogramming during PR mediated PTI, and NRA-mediated uh, ETS are extensively over. Sometimes uh, some genes uh, seem to be induced or expressed only in PTI or ETI, but it can be simply like a quantitative, uh, like a threshold. And maybe there's no really, really specific uh, like a component uh, for PTI or ETI in terms of gene expression. But you know, we, we need to see. Our next question is from John Giro, Giraldo, and it kind of is going to the philosophy of you know the models that we use as scientists and we you know sometimes land on for a lot of our thinking. And so raises an important question. If there's no clear distinction between PTI and ETI. Um, has been proposed by our colleagues uh, years ago. Should we definitively abandon this zigzag model? Um, and what elements of the Jones Dangle zigzag model are still valid? Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that uh, people ask this. So, zigzag model is still valid. Yeah. So, this is still important concept. Right? So, when we think about how the plant and pathogen like a fight each other. So this, uh, like, a, you know, the immunity is triggered by conserved molecules and pathogens, uh, like, uh, inhibit this immunity and plants evolve a receptor to recognize. So this zigzag model 
uh, is, is still valid. Okay. But when we just think about like a mechanistic things, so this uh, zigzag model uh, is sometimes just too simple. So just when we describe certain things, like a mechanism, we just need to describe more carefully. Right? But this zigzag model probably uh, will be uh, valid uh, for forever. Yeah. That's an interesting one. I, I really do think that the way that we frame ideas affects the kinds of questions we ask. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's what led to this really rising to be one of our top questions. Um, so Ryohei Nakano asks, when calcium is so important for so many physiological aspects, yes, how do plants discriminate between different calcium influx signals triggered by different stimuli? I, I don't know, maybe they don't, right? That's the whole, that's the whole question of multiple inputs, but I, I'd love to hear what you think. Right, so I think uh, this is one of uh, probably the million dollars questions. Uh, how organisms decode different calcium influx? So uh, I'm not uh, the expert in this, uh, this field, but uh, uh, as far as I know, it's, we still don't understand how uh, organisms uh, decode like a calcium uh, influx. Maybe like a, a different, the, the concentration calcium, also the frequency or the, the where calcium influx occurs. All of these probably uh, the, the organism or including plants may have such, some systems to, okay, in this case, uh, this is a, like a MAMP signal or NLR signals, something like this. But uh, yeah, so I think uh, this uh, needs to be investigated uh, much, much more. Yeah. Leung Yang says, thanks for a nice talk. Um, kind of going back to activation downstream of NLR. So what are the very early first events after NLR activation? And how is it connecting to downstream components like EDS1? And maybe I'll add on, do you have any ideas about how you might go about doing that now that you have these models set forth that we, that's a critical one we have to go after? Right. So, you know, the, what probably, you know, this, uh, uh, people should ask uh, Jane Parker, you know, like, uh, you know the push her <laughs> to be this function of EDS1. So the, the thing is that EDS1 uh, is the central immune component. So maybe downstream or upstream of you know, NRR. So uh, the one, the, the clear thing is EDS1 is required. So this is absolutely required for TR, especially TR type and NLR signal. But the, the molecular function with this one, yeah, how this, the, more, the protein functions uh, is not understood. So the EDS1 was, I think, cloned uh, 20, uh, 20, like 23 years ago. Uh, still, we don't know how EDS1 functions molecularly. So I think it is, uh, yeah, people, people should find out how this one molecularly functions. Yeah, it's, it's uh, always amazing that all these things that we think we know that you realize when you look closely are big, big gaps in our knowledge, really exciting. I mean, for people listening, these are, these are exciting areas for future investigation. Um, Okay, Raul Mart Martin asks, are damps always produced during the immune response or are there inactive damps in the cytoplasm waiting to be activated, similar to the mammalian system? So, you know, the some damps are like uh, always localized in the cell, such as ATP. So then when cell damage and then ATP is released and this extra cell ATP is recognized as sort of a uh, damage or dangers, and then the neighboring cells can activate these uh, defense responses. So this is one type of dumps. And another type is some, some, sometimes people say the fight uh, cytokines. So these are uh, like uh, plants produce as like uh, precursors, for example, the pre-proteins. And then it seems this pre-protein is processed. And then so this, uh, the processed parts of the protein is released and then neighbor cells 
recognize such such molecules. So in, uh, the both, so like uh, the plants uh, pre always prepare and the cell damage the possibly uh, triggered passive release. And sometimes plants uh, prepare like a pretty uh, sort of proteins and then the, during immune response, immune activations, this pre-protein is processed and released. And this may be more active uh, release. That, um, just want to remind people that we had a, a terrific talk last fall from Antonio Molina, who really focused on this whole question of damp signaling. And we still have that recorded. So um, I, I recommend you go back and take a look um, or read his series of articles, really cool series of articles. Okay, I'll leave the next to Mary Beth. All right, um, Kenichi, you know, we know that plant defense hormones will play a critical role. We didn't really talk about their involvement so much in your talk. So the question here is, is salicylic acid required for full activation of both PTI and ETI? Right, so uh, in a way, uh, salicylic acid uh, is required for full activation of everything. <laughs> so uh, during PR-mediated PTI and ETI, uh, NLR mediated DTI and uh, systemic acquire, acquire resistance. So salicylic acid is always there. So this is a, a key uh, hormone uh, that uh, sort of uh, uh, mediates almost all immune responses. So the salicylic acid probably is more, more or less like an amplifier of uh, different immune responses uh, in PTI, ETI, and uh, systemic acquired resistance. So, but you know, SA, uh, salicylic acid always, always there. So Ping Li asks, why does treatment with high concentration of PAMPs, for example, um, flag 22, not trigger cell death? So uh, this is an uh, interesting question. So the flag 22, uh, is such a strong uh, immune trigger. So this is uh, one of the most potent uh, immune trigger. But somehow this uh, like a flag 22 triggered immune responses are mostly very transient. So plants uh, respond to the flag 22 uh, within one hour or several hours, then all responses are back to normal. So maybe this uh, transient response doesn't lead to service. So maybe the immune response need to be long enough to uh, finally execute uh, cell death. But in some, some cases, uh, mumps uh, can trigger cell death. So this may be an uh, interesting example to investigate why some mump can trigger cell death. Then we, maybe we, we can understand um, how, um, like, uh, why fracturing doesn't usually trigger so that. So just, um, we have a, a request for a recording and yes, there will be a recording. Probably won't be up until tomorrow because it's very late where we are, um, but, but tomorrow we'll have that up. And I believe Ashley has pasted that into the chat where you can go, um, but you can always um, find it where you registered. Our next question is from Zhu Wang, and it really has uh, us thinking about different organelles. So with the TNL resistosome assembled in the cytoplasm and transferred and function in the nucleus, what do you think could be going on between the cytoplasm and the nucleus? Uh, yeah, well, simple answer, we, you know, we don't know. Uh, but uh, um, I, yeah, I don't know. So uh, the based on the, the previous publications, so some TNL definitely localized to nucleus. So why not uh, forming registrosome in the nucleus and then do something? But uh, how these uh, nuclear events connect to like uh, EDS1 and other like uh, CCR type NLR, so this is not understood. I think uh, uh, it can be, but uh, we don't know yet. Okay, uh, looks like Antila Fredrickson asks, immunity has been scrutinized and centered with pathogens, uh, but some symbionts have been found to release effectors and microbiota members have MAMPs as well. How much of what we know about plant immunity 
appears to be applicable with the harmless microbes. And before I let Kenichi answer, I just wanna say that we have a special issue coming out on this exact question in May. So I hope you'll check back uh, and see some of those papers, but go ahead, Ken, I will leave that to you. Right, so uh, the, well, that's uh, the really, really hot topic that, uh, that many people are investigating now. So this, um, uh, so the, the, the last year, so the people, the Cheyenne Sh uh, group published a uh, nature paper that uh, the PR mediated PTI uh, definitely contribute to um, the structure of uh, the phytosphere microbiota. So yes, this, uh, um, let's say um, harmful or maybe, maybe the microbiota uh, triggers PTI and PR mediated PTI and the PR mediated PTI contribute to uh, the structure in the microbiota. But also the, I think a definition of like a beneficial, like a harmless and pathogens uh, is uh, sometimes not really uh, like a, it's a, it's, you know, it, it's kind of continuous, right? So some pathogens may not be pathogen, sometimes beneficial and some benefit, beneficial ones can be pathogenic. And then and the harm, like, a look, a, like it looks like a harmful one, uh, harmless one, it can be pathogen, it can be, uh, can be beneficial. So I think that, that many, many things can be very context dependent. And so this, uh, how plant immunity uh, controls uh, many different types of uh, microbes that I think in the next five years, we will know really much, much more. Guang Chao Xian has a question uh, getting, thinking about the evolutionary perspective. So uh, is there any uh, evolutionary connection between the crosstalk of PTI and ETI? And has this emerged along with recent arms race between plants and pathogens? Or do you think that this is actually an ancient mechanism that existed originally in plant immunity. Right, um, that's very good questions. Um, so, yeah, when PR mediated immunity and when NRR mediated immunity evolve. So, in mechanistically, uh, it seems the PR mediated PTA is like a primary immune systems and then there, there are sort of a potentiate or also they potentiate each other but without PR and there are may not be that functional but the when they really evolve I think we need to really investigate uh, like a different plant species and exactly like a, what kind of components uh, evolve and what kind of components become functional and in which species do these connections uh, happen or not. So I think this is really important questions, the evolution. So how plant immune system evolve? So this is really, uh, I think that we uh, as a community should really uh, pay attention. Yes, good question. And I just want to say we're, we will probably take, I think, two more questions um, because uh, we are now, um, we've been doing this for a little while. Um, terrific questions. I, I would love to be able to answer, to have, can, can answer all of them, um, but we're not going to have time for that. So I'm going to pick um, one more here and then maybe Mary Beth, you pick one more. Sure. So um, we have a question. If we engineer a strong immune receptor, either a PRR or an NLR into the plant genome, in a way, isn't that better than vaccinating because the plant's progeny will also have immunity against that effector? Right, so this is uh, the important uh, sort of a concept. So the plants or probably any kind of organisms cannot uh, activate immunity all the time because uh, probably immunity or immune responses are costly. And uh, if plants 
put the resource on the immunity too much. So the growth is compromised. So that's the probably um, uh, you know, the like uh, all, all the time like uh, um, the expressing such non-self and then activating immunity uh, may not be a, a good idea. But maybe there might be a way to uh, condition conditionally do this kind of things. But that's uh, I think uh, you need to yeah, test different things. All right. I'll close out with a question from Dennis Halterman, kind of interesting to thinking about how these complexes work together. So many NLRs and PRRs are thought to be genus or species specific, but this is mainly based on trying to move one gene alone. So if ETI and PTI are linked and P PRRs need NLRs and vice versa, is it possible that PRRs need to be moved with certain NLRs in order for them to work properly. And this would have great implications, say, in translating our work uh, for engineering resistance. Right, that's a good point. So the, uh, like uh, some PRR, uh, such as FRS2, is really, really widely conserved in angiosperms. So, okay. And some uh, PR is only like a sometimes brass specific, but the transferring this PR to um, like a other uh, species like a tomato, uh, beautifully uh, functions. So um, sometimes this just transferring the PR to another species which doesn't have this PR is perfectly functions. But in probably some cases, if this, the the PR and NR relationship is very tight. Then a such core transfer may, may work uh, nicely. So for example, uh, like a helper NRs, some helper NRs are widely consulted, but some helper NRs are uh, Solanaceae specific. So in this case, some um, Solanaceae plant, uh, like uh, this uh, helper NRs and PR uh, may be really tightly linked. And then they may, maybe it's good to be transferred together to another species. Yeah, so that's a, a good point. I think uh, probably we should do more this kind of experiments to transfer you know, these receptors to different species, how they function, and to understand not what well, not only like a, um, the, the providing some agriculture practice, but also the understanding evolution of plant immune system. And then we, we know, oh, this doesn't work, then why? Then maybe this co-transfer uh, is necessary. Yeah. Well, thank you. This has been terrific. And, and obviously based on the large number of really good questions we have in the Q&A box still, um, we could go on for a really long time. And I, I apologize to everybody who is, has written in some of these questions that we won't be able to get to. Um, but really terrific, very fun discussion here with all of your questions. I just wanna remind you, especially if we have not gotten to your questions that um, to encourage you to take a look at the paper at the very lovely perspective and review that Yulu and Kenichi Tsuda uh, wrote in MPMI and uh, remember, of course, that he is the corresponding author. And as always, one way you can communicate with our authors is by email, and that's they're associated with their papers. And so you can easily find him there and um, pose some of your questions. Um, so we're going to stop there. But a lot of these ideas and topics, they're so exciting. Um, we're going to be continuing some of them in an e-symposia um, this summer. So hopefully everyone will be there. So uh, I hope you'll join me at least from wherever you are and in, in thanking uh, Ken for a terrific talk, really complicated, uh, interesting and important uh, topic. I, you can see, everybody can see now why I invited uh, Ken to write this review because it's, it, it takes a delicate hand to pull all of this, this stuff together. So, and I'd, I'd really like to thank um, Mary Beth Mudgett, who's a, a faculty member at Stanford and our ISMPMI president to, for joining us today and uh, acting as co-host. So thank you. Yeah, it was fun.
Kenichi, that was wonderful. And uh, good luck recruiting for your lab. I'm sure you're going to get a lot of takers. Yes, I think so. <laughs> you had a good audience here for that. Lots of people typing in now saying thank you and really enjoyed the talk. So thanks to all of you. And our next seminar is coming up in a month. And um, I'm it's kind of late for me here, so I don't remember who it is right now. But uh, <laughs> another another good seminar. I, I well, I'm not even going to go out on a limb and make that mistake. But uh, another good seminar with another talk um, from the uh, a paper in the MPMI journal. And maybe uh, Ashley could could you type in that link for everyone of where to find the next seminar? That would be great. Um, so anyway, uh, thanks to all of you who stayed, and I hope you join us next month for our next What's New in MPMI seminar. Ah, and yes, you can find the link there now. So go take a look, see who's coming up next and join us. Thanks everyone. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.